As we continue with our service this morning, I want to read from Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, in the city of the great king, within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic, they took to flight. Trembling, they took hold of them there, anguished as a woman in labor. By the east wind and shattered as the ships of Tarshish, as we have heard, so have we seen in the city of our Lord of, of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. Let's pray. Father, you are great, and you are greatly to be praised. Lord, I pray that is on our hearts right now as we continue this service, as we begin to, to sing to you, to sing about you, to sing in response to the great things you have done for us. Lord, help us to see you rightly. Lord, help us to, to see ourselves as, as one that you loved, that you sent Christ to be our Savior, that we have forgiveness because of Christ on the cross and his resurrection that we are adopted into the family of God, not because of our own works, but because all that Jesus did for us. Lord, help us to never lose sight of that. Lord, as we continue with looking into your word and, Lord, just praying to you this morning, Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, speak to us this morning. Lord, speak individually to each heart, minister in the way that each person needs to be ministered to this morning. Lord, we just want to give you glory and honor. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Great is the Lord and greatly is to be praised. Psalm 48, one of the first scriptures back in 79 that I remember memorizing. And it's a good, good, yeah, takes me way back, 79. And uh, as he read that this morning, Many, many thoughts came back because that song is a scripture song, and I would sing it for you, but we'll move on to the, the songs that we actually have playing today. So anyway, let's worship and praise God in this sanctuary this morning. Amen. <laughs> You fill my life 
you, Lord. Amen.
thank you for your grace and your mercy.
so much. Thank you, for th thank you for another day of grace. Thank you for your word. Thank you for fall. Yes. Amen, somebody. Amen. Thank you for chili and all that good stuff. Thank you, Lord, for hot wings. I could keep going with food. But <laughs> Lord, we're just so thankful for everything that you're doing in and around us and just how much you love us and how much you care for us. And so God, as I open your word, I just ask that you would speak to us today, that we would hear from you, that you would give encouragement. Love, Lord, we ask you, you do that wonderful thing where you challenge us and you encourage us at the same time. Build us up in the Lord and help us to be more and more like Christ Jesus. Help us to know him more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, church. Well, we are continuing our sermon series in the book of Joshua, we've called Bound for the Promised Land. We've got, uh, Lord willing, uh, this will be the second to last message in Joshua. I've really enjoyed it, personally. I I've really enjoyed it. It's, it's such, a, it's such a, a, a book full of blessed assurance, honestly. Um, so again, we still aren't certain on what we're going to be talking about uh, two, two weeks from now, so con continue to pray about that. So we are bound for a promised place. We are bound for the new heavens and the new earth. Amen? There's no war to come in, in the life that is to come. Uh, God has promised that he will make all things new in the age to come. So Israel was given the promised land of Canaan, and God promised it, and so they received it. He never fails us. Amen? Amen? He never fails. If he says he's going to do something, he does it. And so last week we looked at Joshua 22. I, I won't go into all the details, but there was an altar of witness. You got 
two and a half tribes on the east side. You've got uh, the remaining tribes on the west side of the Jordan, uh, and the eastern tribes build a copy of the altar of the Lord, though they were told, uh, the Israelites were told there's only one place to build the altar. Well, they didn't inform why the other side was making the altar, and so there were assumptions and bad communication all the way around it. But the, truth, uh, the truthfulness of it was that the altar was built as a reminder for the generations to come, that even though those, those people weren't living in the promised land, they were still God's people. It was a reminder that the Lord is God. And so we may misunderstand each other, but we, I hope you take it as a comfort that even when you have those moments of man, like, nobody gets me, nobody understands me. God does, and God actually understands you better than you understand yourself. And to me, that is, that's another blessed assurance. So thank you, Lord. And so we too can be a witness to those around us. We can, be, we can point people to God just like that altar did. We can point people to God or, and remind them through Jesus Christ that the Lord is God. We should tell people about Jesus. Amen? That's not just for the preachers and the evangelists or the prophets or whoever. We should all tell people about Jesus. If you found the kingdom of God is like treasure, and, and if you've got this treasure, this is the most beautiful thing that you can give somebody. That's why the Bible says how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. There's no good news better than the good news. There's no news better than the good news of Jesus. Take it. Take it out. Tell people about him. And he'll, we, we'll talk about all the great things. We're, we're not going to sit in glory and talk about all the great things that we did, right? Actually, we're going to say to each other at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're going to sit around the table. We're going to feast. I don't know what we're going to eat. Maybe we'll eat chili. I don't know. But we're going to sit around that table and we're going to say to each other, he has done great things. Amen? He has done great things, and he's continuing to do great things. He promises great things, and he's faithful to carry out great things. And so speaking of that, we've spent several weeks talking about God's faithfulness and his promises. We sang about God's faithfulness. It's been a major theme, the faithfulness of God flowing throughout the book of Joshua. And so the sermon title for this morning is Promises We Can Count On. Promises We Can Count On. I could have called this Conserving your joy. Conserving your joy. Stick with me. There's really two ways I want to approach this topic of God and his promises. There is a contrast. There are things that we take for granted. There are things that we feel like we're owed. There are things that we might feel like we're entitled to. And then there's these other things called the promises of God. The things that God says that we will have. Many of us don't have a problem figuring out what we want in the moment, right? pretty good grasp of what I want, like whether it's a Diet Coke or whether it's a chili dog. You figure that out. And, and well beyond that, more serious matters, like if I need healing or if I want comfort for my soul, we know that we want that. But it honestly takes a life dedicated to God's perspective to ask him for what we need, okay? It takes a life dedicated to God to understand, to hear him be like, okay, this is the thing that I should desire. This is the thing that I should want. This is the ought. I ought to seek this. And so if you haven't already, turn to Joshua 23. I'm going to read this passage from beginning to end, and we're going to talk about it. I'm not going to go super in-depth on everything going on here, but I want us to see it. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, beautiful verse right there, uh, Joshua was old and well advanced in years. Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all those nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Behold, I have allotted you as an inheritance for your tribes, those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight. You shall possess the land, just as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore, be very strong to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them, but you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations, and as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised you. Be very careful, therefore, to to love the Lord your God. 
For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, for they shall be a snare and a trap and a whip at your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from all the good ground that the Lord your God has given you. And now I'm about to go to the way of the, all the earth and know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from all the good land that he has given to you. The word of the Lord. Scary verse to end on, right? But we take the good with the bad. Israel was to heed this warning they were given. God is not wrong for saying these things to the Israelites. God can use fear and encouragement. God can use fear and encouragement to motivate people. You see that all over the Old Testament. He uses both here. Both. You, get, you actually get encouragement and fear. Uh, not fear of people, places, or things. And in fact, fear of people, places, and things is what kept them wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. But fear of God. Fear that God is the one true being to be feared. The triune Lord himself. So, for the sake of context, Joshua just comes out and says it. I'm old. I'm old. I'm advanced in years. You can take whichever one you want. Uh, he's, he's refined. Probably around 110 years old, the, the Lord had provided rest from war after Canaan's conquest. Verse 1 is, is, just seems almost like it's prophetic to be talking about today. He's provided rest from war. The Lord has given rest to Israel. That, that, that's a temporary rest. And there's an eternal rest coming because we know there's nothing but re not rest going on right now today. But we can pray for that rest to come back and we can pray for rest for all of us, for all nations and peace in times of war. God provides rest. If we go to him, we can find rest for our souls. Jesus promised that. This is uh, the second of three assemblies at the end of the book of Joshua. We'll look at the final one next week, the one that many of you have maybe heard. Choose this day whom you will serve. And there are overlapping themes with these chapters and a large call to faithfulness. So that for context, again, they are likely assembling at Shiloh, where the place of the altar. He calls the elders, the heads, judges, and officers to speak. And he's going to talk to them. And it's strongly implied that these words are not just going to stop with them. They're going to take them to the rest of the people. And after all, we have it recorded here in Scripture. So it has not only been preserved for them, it has been preserved for us. And so why are they gathered? Joshua says, I'm old. They're not there just for Joshua to tell him how old he is. Verse 3, you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It is the Lord your God who has fought for you. The reason they're gathered is to be reminded once again, hey guys, God did what he said he was going to do for us, right? He did it. We're here. We've taken Canaan. We have, what we, we, we have what we were promised because God keeps his promises. He fought for us. And the truth be told, we couldn't have taken the land on our own. We couldn't do these things on our own. And, and it's shown that over and over in Joshua. There's no way they could have done this without God. There's no way Israel could have taken Canaan without God. It's made clear by what happened in the battles where God was not with them. They took the land in faith, but they had no chance without God leading the way. So in light of that, how many know that God's bringing us through every single season of life? God will bring you through every single of life, season, single season of life. The Bible says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. He who began the work is going to finish what he started. God always finished what he starts. The, the, the song Amazing Grace, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. What's next? Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The grace of God doesn't save us, just to leave us. The grace of God continues to work throughout our life. 
sees us through. And so remember God, this is what the Lord has done. This is why they're, this is why they're gathering. Therefore, this is what we should do. Then remember how you got here? Now this is how you should live here. Verse four, behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes, those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I've already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea and to the west. Lord, your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight and you shall possess the land just as God has promised you. Now, there's something incredible about those verses, and we can gloss right over it. God kept up his end of the bargain, right? He kept his end of the covenant. But Israel, what about them? A little bit of a struggle. They struggled. They weren't faithful in driving out all the Canaanites from the land. It would cause problems for future generations because they didn't, but God still kept his promise even though the Israelites failed to do what they covenanted with him to do. When we are faithless, he is faithful. If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful to forgive our sins. That's good news, right? And it's not, it's not, it's not, because sometimes if we're being, I mean, I hope we're being honest about this, but sometimes we sin and sometimes we are unfaithful. That doesn't mean we celebrate our sinfulness. And that doesn't mean we're happy about being unfaithful. We don't boast in that. But it does mean that we have a great God who is faithful and forgiving at all times, even when we stray. So there's a constant struggle in our culture, I believe, to stand on God's promises. Because if we're being honest, sometimes we're more concerned with doing our own thing, our own kingdoms, right? The, the promises that I think I've been promised. We can be more focused on things that God never promised instead of seeking to live according to the promise. I think we can do it better sometimes. And that brings us to the first point. We should remind ourselves daily of what God has and hasn't promised us. Remember I said I could have called this conserving your joy. There's a reason for that of what God has and hasn't promised us. This isn't easy, but it's a safeguard for joy. Have you ever been disappointed by somebody not keeping a promise? Maybe an institution. Kids used to like watching the the Lorax movie based on the book by Dr. Seuss. You know, the guy that cuts the trees down. He says he wasn't going to cut the trees down, but then what did he do? He wouldn't cut the trees down after he promised that he wouldn't. And so the Lorax is upset, obviously. But... It was in the, he broke his promise because he saw if he cut trees down, he could make more profits on the product that he was trying to sell. That's the long story short. People can keep promises, but people can also break promises. Let your yes be yes, the Bible says. Let your no be no. Constantly seeking assurance. We're singing about assurance. We want security. We want protection. We want Comfort, we want stability, and, and that, none of that is necessarily bad, though it is bad if that's, that's the ultimate, that's the goal. I just want to be comfortable for the rest of life. I want life to be a cake. That can be bad. So if we're being honest with ourselves, a lot of the time the things that we want to try to find, security, protection, comfort, provision, stability, all the, a lot of the times those things are nothing more than a mirage. They're not real. We're just believing something that we shouldn't. When we're failed by people, we're failed by workplaces, employers, insurance companies, they go back on a promise, they change a policy, how does that make you feel? You're distraught. You're upset. Misplaced joy. You get unhappy. I had a season of that before God called my family to liberty. I I was promised something that was uh, not carried out. I know many other people that were promised things that did not receive what they were told they were going to get. And so what was my uh, reaction to that? I was very distraught. I was upset because I believed what I was told. Folks, God is faithful and can't lie, right? People can be faithful and they can be truthful, but people can also be unfaithful and people can also be not tell the truth. They can lie. Advertisements are lying to you all the time. 
you know that? If you drink this coffee, brother, you're going to be so happy. You know what makes life better? Pumpkin spice. You know, and now everybody said amen. Yeah. Is it the best flavor? No, I'm not going to get into a debate. But advertisements are built on, some of them are built on lies. If you just have this one thing, you're going to be happy. Sometimes people, employers, and policymakers make promises they can't even keep. They'll say, raise taxes. I'll say no. Some of you lived through that. You raise the taxes. You can't make promises that you can't keep. But this, this, this idea of security, like a labor union and a company, they, t- they strike up a deal. They say, hey, you're not going to strike, and we're not going to lock you out until the company goes under, and then the promise is void. This idea of security, it's, it's a mirage. We promise to never do this. They can fail too. And so in reality, we, we get to this word. You like to use this when you're in employment. A lot of blue-collar guys say, hey, man, hey, man, I know we've got to do this job. This job stinks. But you know what they call it? Job security. Job security. It's going to keep me employed. Job security is actually a lie. Life security is a lie. We don't know how many days we have. You know that? You can feel entitled to life. You can feel like I'm, I'm owed this. I'm owed, I'm owed from beginning to end. I'm owed my youth. I'm owed my high school experience. I'm owed college. I'm owed my work days. I'm owed my golden years and retirement and all that and beyond. And the truth of the matter is that's not been promised to any of us. But we think it has. And so when it doesn't happen, what do we do? We get disappointed and we lose our joy because we put it in something else. Our days are numbered. James 4 says it like this. You've heard this verse, James 4, 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town, spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. That's Bible. That's what the Bible says. How disappointed and miserable we can make ourselves by believing words, by believing words from people that don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Only God is in complete control. Only God. And it goes beyond that. So I'm I'm going to get get a little serious. I struggled with this, but I I, I got to talk about it. So last week I was talking to Roy. Uh, Brother Roy met me in in the foyer talking about heaven and hell. There aren't as many sermons on hell as there used to be. Just to be honest. We don't talk about it. Why? I, I, I can only conject, I, I make conjectures. I, I, we talked about it here. We have talked about it here. I know Pastor Lon's talked about it. But it did bring something to my mind. Uh, we, we can't separate the bad news from the good news. This is everywhere. Your culture is really, really good at telling you good news and leaving out the bad sides. You're really going to enjoy that Big Mac, brother. You might not enjoy the time later when it's time for the Big Mac to go the other way. Okay? I'm not trying to be, on, I'm not trying to be you know, crude, but it's true. We do that with the gospel. We do that with the gospel. The gospel is the same message it's always been, right? Jesus Christ was crucified, died, he was buried. On the third day, he rose again. And all who believes in him, whosoever believes in him, shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. That's a promise. And in fact, the only reason I was thinking about this is because of of thinking about the promises of God. What I've been promised, what we haven't been promised. We, We can find ourselves disappointed about things that we thought were promised and they never really were. And so you're like, what are you talking about? What's this, what's he on about? Would change the gospel? Who's changed the gospel? It's not changed. You can't change the gospel, but you can alter the presentation. You can change the emphasis. You can make it sound like something it isn't. Perspective. What we deserve versus what we receive. So removing the bad news severely cripples the good news to the point where the good news actually isn't really good anymore. It's actually indifferent news. You wonder why people are indifferent toward the faith today? It's because the gospel message is not presented in full. 
And I'm talking about mainline. There are churches everywhere that are faithful about this. So I'm just, just a thought experiment here. You tell me what you hear more today. Number one, I'm going to give you a gospel presentation, all right? Number one, you're the victim. God sees your hurt. He's seen all that you've been through. You've been wronged. And brother, sister, you deserve better. You don't deserve the pain. You don't deserve the hurt. You don't deserve the shame. You don't deserve guilt. Everything that's happened to you is just wrong from beginning to end. God sees all that stuff you've endured. And if you just believe in Jesus, God's going to take care of all your problems, all your pain, all your struggles, all those people that have been mean to you, God's going to take care of it. Just believe in him, and he'll take care of all that trouble because let's be honest, you and I both know that you deserve better. Was that a gospel? Some of you, yeah. Hold on. What about this? Have you heard, how, tell me how often you've heard this. I'm talking about mainline, mainstream Christianity, okay? Number two, you're a sinner. Oh. See, I'm, already, I'm, I'm, I'm feeding into it. I'm sorry. You have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We deserve wrath for our sins because apart from Jesus, we stand guilty in the presence of a holy God. Because of Jesus' blood covering the totality of the sins I've committed, God doesn't give me what I deserve, but on the other hand, he gives me all these things I don't deserve, which are freedom, righteousness, goodness in him. You don't deserve anything good, dear friend, but God has given you grace. So you receive mercy. You get this thing called unmerited favor, but don't think for one second that you've deserved it or earned a single bit of it. Which one of those have you heard more often? The first one. You know why? Because it sells better. It makes people, it, it, it does, it looks better. And, and let me say, let me, here's the thing. It doesn't matter which one, it doesn't matter the frequency. It doesn't matter which one's heard more often. What matters more than that is which one is more in line with the truth. Which one is more in line with what's truthful? And why am I talking about this? Because I don't want us to produce a generation of Christians who are not countercultural in the right ways, that feel entitled to all the good things of life, that God is mad at them whenever something bad happens, or when bad things happen in their life, they've done something wrong. Christians that are discouraged daily because life isn't going according to plans, their faith departs when difficulty shows up. Christians that are discouraged in all ways, if we want to produce that trend in the local church, then we have to keep doing what the advertiser doing and giving people the sweets and don't give them any of the substance. You take away the substance and the sweets are just treats that opiate for the day but don't bring the joy for tomorrow. Keep telling them this, that God promised them things that he never actually guaranteed. Truthfully, though, I, I do want to say this because it, it, this is, okay, I'm not trying to fit everybody into those two frames because truthfully, I'm going to play devil's advocate with myself. There are people that are victims, okay? I'm not saying that that's not true. There are people mistreated by the sinful actions of others. It happens all the time. It's happening right now. There are things I see and I think, why God? How long, God? There are certainly victims of horrors in this world, but when it comes to God... Me and you, every one of us, is guilty of sin. There is sin out there. There's also sin in here. Okay? Don't lose that. You lose that part of the message, you're going to lose the gospel. I'm not apart from the culture either. I'm, I'm in it with you. I struggle with it. But there's nothing new under the sun. And so the wilderness wandering, for instance, perfect example, that took place for 40 years, and it happened because the Israelites did not believe God's promise. They trusted their fears. That, 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 those people look scary over there. It wasn't a good advertisement. They wanted them to go into Canaan. They should have offered Big Macs for everybody. But difficulties are not meant to scare us away from God. Difficulties are actually meant to encourage and strengthen our relationship with God. And so I want to focus on the promises of God, not the entitlements of today's age. Not everybody, not the, not the advertiser, advertiser's approach that says, you deserve the best. Because sometimes that's not true. And I know that I don't always deserve the best. Here's the thing. God's promises are better too. I'm going to get into that. 
I don't want to hear just what makes me feel good, tickles my ears, all that stuff. I want to hear what I need to hear. And God did that over and over again with his people. He did it in the old covenant. He does it in the new. He does it through the scriptures. He'll tell us what we need to hear right here. Verses 6 and 8. Be strong to keep all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Turn aside from neither right hand nor the left that you not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of their names or their gods or swear by them, serve by them, bow down, cling to the Lord your God, guys. You've got to cling to the Lord just as you have done this day. Cling to God. Christian understanding, cling to Christ. Hold fast to his promises. Hold on and don't let go. His promises are trustworthy. And that brings me to the second point. That was, that was the rough part. Now, here we go. Good news. Not one promise of God will fail, and his promises are the best kind. His promises are the best kind. It might not always feel like they are, but they are. They are totally the best kind of all. And, it, and his promises are the best, and the reason is obvious. The reason is actually right there, because not one of them falls aback. Not one of them fails. All God's promises are kept They always happen at just the right time. That's why we ask people, that's why we wear those shirts, right? Do you know him? Do you know him? It changes everything. If you you do, if you have that intimate relationship with Jesus, then you can, just like we did earlier. You can approach the throne of grace and you can ask for anything at any time of need. He hears you. He cares for you. He is for you. He will gladly take the requests you bring to him. Approach the throne of grace in your time of need. So he has promised to answer our prayers. That's a promise. He promises to meet our needs. If life gets tough sometimes, it doesn't mean, younger people, if life gets hard, it doesn't mean that God is mad at you or that you did something wrong. It's called life. Jesus said this, and people take this out of context, and I know you've heard it. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That does not mean that nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. The Bible also says that in this world you will have trouble. I don't like that promise. God said it, though, and it's true. You'll have trouble, but fear not. Why? Because I've overcome the world. So you don't not to be afraid of the trouble. So if you want to be less disappointed, if you want to conserve your joy, then be careful about the promises that you believe and the promises that you build your life around. You can kill your joy if you put it in places where it doesn't belong. I'm not saying it to be skeptical either, but be intentional about the promises that you receive. And you can't go wrong with God. He doesn't fail. Verse 9, the Lord has driven out among you a great and strong nation, nations. And as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand. Why? Because I'm pretty tough. No, because it is the Lord who fights for you, just as he promised. Be very careful then to love the Lord your God. He did it. Why'd they get Canaan? Because they were great people? The best people? No. Because they have a great God. He fought for them just as he promised them. So what should it be? What, what, what should we take from that? Take care to love the Lord our God. That's the answer. Cling to God and take care that you love God. Why? Obedience is the daughter of faith. Right faith gives birth to proper obedience. It's not bad. People get, ooh, the obedience word. People get all bent out of shape about obedience. But it's not just an Old Testament thing. It's actually a really good thing. It's okay to want to please God. The Bible says that. Make it our goal to please God. Doesn't mean that you don't believe the gospel. Doesn't mean that you don't believe that Jesus died for every single sin that you've committed. Doesn't mean that you're working to fulfill some righteous requirement of the law. It just simply means that you love God and you want to show him that you love him by living that way. That's all it means. Obedience. The approach has changed. Christ earned our salvation. We receive righteousness. 
Our works don't save us. They are the fruit of salvation. I want to put a, I want to put a scripture up in front of you. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to see, see this connection. The New Testament, this, this passage is so wonderful at coupling this. Boom. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us. Eternal life. Eternal life. That's a promise. Hear the word. You see it right there. Hear this. Hear the word. Guys, what, what did Joshua tell the Israelites? Do not depart from the word, from the law of Moses. God tells us we've got the word, we've got the New Testament as well. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. Cling to God. Remember the promise that he made. What is that promise? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so in the next part, I'm not going to read all of it again, Joshua 23, Joshua starts to lay these things out. He, he says, if you chase after the same things that these other nations are going after, then they're going to become a snare to you. You, got other, you might not have other nations, but you've got a lot of different ideologies flowing around you in this culture, okay? You've got a lot of different thought, a lot of different worldviews, and they can become a snare. If we're chasing after all the same things that the culture is going after, then they can become traps. They can become snares. Cling, cling to God. Don't make God's meadow a bramble of thorns. Don't do that. Don't bring that stuff into God's presence. If you don't want evil to come upon you, then avoid it. Our God is for us. But think about this, and we love that verse, don't we? It's so true. If God is for us, then what? Who could be against us? Amen. Thank you, God. What if you're doing something that goes against him? You think about that? If, or God is for us. God cannot assist us. He's still for us, but he cannot assist us in aligning ourselves against him. He's not going to help you be against him. For he cannot be against himself. House divided against himself. That was not originally Abraham Lincoln. That was Jesus Christ. But... Abraham made it famous. So, put off the world, put on Jesus. Not only avoid evil, but abide in good. Let go of the world's promises. I don't know what you've believed. I don't know who's told you what. But if you're holding on to that like it's gospel, you need to let it go. And you need to look in this book right here. And you need to stand on the promises of God. Because he will not fail. Not one of them failed to Israel. Not one of them is going to fail to you. Verse 14. The last verse. I'm going to read this in Joshua 23 one more time. Verse 14. And now I am out, about to go the way of the earth. And you know in your hearts and in your souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All of them have come to pass. Not one has failed. You might as well just highlight that. Reread it, highlight it, reflect on it. Not one thing failed that was promised to the Israelites. They failed on their end. God didn't fail on his end. And dear friend, not one of the good things that have been promised to us in Christ Jesus will fail. What kind of promises? Psalm 11950. This is my comfort in affliction, that your promise gives me life, hope. Uphold me according to your promise that I may live. Let me not be put to shame in my hope. This all comes from Psalm 119. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promises. The Lord kept his promise to Adam. Redemption after the fall. You're going to bruise his head. He's going to bruise your heel. You're going to bruise his head. Your offspring. Noah, safety from the flood. He was promised safety. He was also promised the sign of the rainbow. God never flood the earth again. Continued that promise that he made to Abraham that your offspring, you're going to have Canaan. We've seen that come to pass. Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David, David, your son's going to build a house for God. Your son's going to build a temple. Guess what? Solomon built a temple. It happened. He did it. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, there's a promise of a new covenant, a better covenant. God says, 
hey, I'm not just going to put this out here. I'm going to put my law, I'm going to put my spirit into their hearts. I'm going to change these hearts of stone. I'm going to make them hearts of flesh. And what we call that in New Testament speak is we call that being born again. Conviction leads to repentance, and that comes from believing the gospel. New Covenant, Hebrews 8, 6 says, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it's enacted on better promises. That's Hebrews 8, 6. Better promises. Promise of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's actually called the promise in some scriptures. I'm sending the promise of the Father to you, Jesus says. Stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high, but wait for the promise of the Father. Holy Spirit, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Peter says this, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. There's a promise, the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Promise, promise, for this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all who will call upon the name of the Lord. What a promise, the promise that though a man die, you know, a woman die, yet shall he or she live by being raised with Jesus Christ. There is the promise of a church called by God and built by God of which the gates of hell will not prevail against them. The promise to answer prayers, the promise to care for us, the promise to provide what we need, the promise in what manner of love it is to be called a child of God, the promise to be called son or daughter, heir, of Jesus Christ, the promise of salvation, sanctification, glorification, receiving a new body. Somebody has said yes, amen. The promise of living in a new world. Get that tent out of here and look forward to the mansions in glory. The promise for peace, the promise for comfort and rest. The promise that God who began a good work in us, the promise that he's not going to let go. The promise that he began a good work in us and he will see it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. That he will be faithful to us even when we aren't faithful to him. The promise of gleaning and experiencing the glory of God for all eternity and face-to-face fellowship with the God who made everything. What more do I need to say? There's more promises. But we don't want the chicken getting cold. Not one of the promises of God will fail, but in case you think it's entirely up to you and the ball is in your court to cling to that promise, I want to give you one more slice of encouragement. We can put it up there. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You've heard this verse. Even if your hearts condemn you, by the way, you feel like, oh man, I really messed up this time. I've gone too far. The Bible says God is greater than our hearts. Woo! Worship team, go ahead and come up. 2 Corinthians 1, 18-20. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has been yes and no. Remember, it starts right there with faithful. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, it's not yes and no, but in Him it is always yes. That is in Jesus. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen for, for His glory. Remember the promises of God. And also remember this, that you can bank on promises that are promised by God. That's what it is. It's a verse about God keeps all his promises. And hey, remember all the promises because all the promises are yes and amen in Jesus. And yes and amen, 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 so be it. That's what amen means. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. Yeah, and they will never perish. How about this promise? No one will snatch them out of my hand. Take that, Satan. Come on. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus is faithful to carry out the work that he began. The promises are in him. He's been holding on to you longer than you've been holding on to him, but I just implore you to keep clinging to Jesus. Every single promise of God finds its yes and its amen. In Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, help us to get this eternal perspective. Help us to see things. Help us to live now, Lord, too, to your glory. Help us to live now to your glory and look forward to that wonderful day when some of the promises that you've promised have been fulfilled. 
but help us also to glean the promises for today that are available to us that we have not yet unearthed. Help us to see your goodness. Help remind us that no matter how much we mess up, if we confess our sins, you're faithful to forgive them. If, if we're faithless, you'll still be faithful. If we, come, if we come back home, just like the prodigal, that you'll always take us, you'll run out to us because you've been clinging to us long before we even tried to cling to you. Lord, help us to spread this good news. Help us to give the good news, the unfiltered good news that causes people to be born again. By your grace and for your glory, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's stand. We're gonna sing. Let's sing. Yeah.
Amen. There's a reason there's so many versions of Amazing Grace. There's some really good news in that that has sweets and substance. And I would never tell you to take away the sweets from the gospel. There's so many good sweets in the gospel. But never lose the substance. And remember that. It's in that, first, that line of that hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Because a wretch is more grateful for their salvation than anybody that thought they deserved it. Grace is amazing, amen? Hey, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Go in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.